Church, if you would please. Let me try that again. Church, if you would please open up your Bibles to Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. Last week we read together through Jonah chapter 1 and what an exciting uh, historical narrative it was. We got to hear about the real life events that happened in Jonah's life. We read how he was called by God, he being a prophet of God, was called by God to go to this great city named Nineveh. And there he was to proclaim to them that devastation was coming from the Lord. He, as a prophet, was supposed to warn them that their great evil had come up before the Lord and that he was about to judge them. We saw that Jonah had no love in his heart for these foreigners, and so he fled from God's presence. And ran away from God's command, seeking to go in the opposite direction by ship across the Mediterranean Sea. And when he did so, God showed his power and his, his control over this universe by sending a great storm up against the ship that Jonah was on. It got worse and worse and worse to the point where the men on the ship were frantic and were tossing things overboard to save the ship from breaking up. They eventually came to Jonah and said, Jonah, why are you sleeping in the ship while we're all frantically calling out to our gods and trying to save the ship? You better get up and do something. And as the tempest continued to rage, they tried to figure out who it was that had sinned against uh, some, some great god that had caused a great tempest. And they threw dice, if you will. They, they cast lots uh, was the practice back then. And the lot God directed to fall upon Jonah. And they questioned Jonah. They said, Jonah, what have you done that has made this tempest come against us on the ship? And Jonah revealed that he was a prophet of the God of heaven and earth that had made the sea and the dry land. And the men who were with him, these people who did not trust in God, who did not fear God as Jonah supposedly did, they became exceedingly afraid, seeing that it was Jonah's God who had power over the wind and the waves. And they said to Jonah, we're going to try one more time to get back to sea, but if not, we'll see what we must do. They asked Jonah, and he said, well, if you want this tempest to quiet down, you must throw me over the edge. And they were reluctant to do so. They paddled hard to get back to the land, but when the tempest would still not rage, they prayed to God and said, God, please don't hold this against us that we're throwing Jonah over sea. He, your prophet, himself said we must do so for the tempest to quiet down. And they take Jonah in the midst of a raging sea storm and toss him over the edge. Jonah thought he was being tossed to his death. The men thought they were tossing Jonah to his death. And as soon as they tossed Jonah overboard, the sea calmed down like that. And the men became even more afraid of the Lord God. And they... they went to shore, and they made sacrifices to God and vows to God. God proved himself to be in complete control over Jonah's circumstances. He proved himself to be in complete control over the wind and the sea and the waves. And we learned last week that when God sends his prophet and when God speaks through his prophet, we can certainly trust what is said because God himself makes sure that what is said is what he wishes to be said. So that's where we left Jonah last week, in the lurch. Jonah was tossed over the edge to his death, the prophet of God, in a horrible, horrible situation. And in Jonah's mind, he's about to die. Let's pick up together, church. I'd like to read with you Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, through the end of Jonah chapter 2. In this section, we're going to see that salvation belongs to the Lord. Do not forsake him. Amen. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Do not forsake him. In this chapter, chapter 2, we'll see that God had the power when Jonah was in trouble to save him and send him. And church, hopefully by the time we're finished looking at chapter 2 of Jonah today, we will have a renewed commitment to live faithfully for the God who can save. So church, let's read Jonah 1.17 through Jonah chapter 2 together. Here is the word of the Lord. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord, 
Out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. To the roots of the mountains I went down. To the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remember the Lord and my prayer came to you. Into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Amen. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Church, having heard the word of the Lord, let's pray together. Oh Lord God, thank you for saving Jonah's life and proving that you are a God who saves. And all salvation belongs to you. You are the author of salvation. Amen. Oh Lord, we come to you in praise and worship seeking salvation. Oh Lord, thank you for your word and how it has blessed us in the past. We pray that you would help us to understand your word this morning. That we would understand it and come to love you more and continue to live faithfully for you and be more and more faithful to you each day because of what we read this morning. God, we do love you and we do trust you. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 The first thing we're going to see in this text is that God has the power. God has the power. God has the power when Jonah is in distress to save him and send him. Most of our text this morning is a prayer from Jonah to God, uh, crying out about his distress and then praising God for the salvation that he gave Jonah in the terrible situation he found himself in. But just before that prayer starts, the author tells us what's happening in Jonah's life. So last week we saw Jonah was tossed overboard, and then this week the narrator progresses the narrative and tells us what happens next. Uh, so between last week and this week, uh, if we were watching a movie of Jonah here, we would have hit pause as he's falling over the side of the ship, right? So this week, the author picks back up in verse 17, and then after verse 17, uh, Jonah 2, verse 1, we get a prayer from Jonah, and then the narrative picks right back up in verse 10. So I want to look first at those two narrative portions, verse 1 and verse 10, and see the progression in what happens to Jonah in this particular situation. So look at verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 17, and then we'll also look at verse 10 together. So in verse 17, here's what God's word says. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah had been thrown overboard, sent to his death. Jonah was the one who suggested this, right? Jonah, the prophet of God, said, hey, all of this storm, all of this calamity that's happening to you guys is happening because of me, God's prophet. I've rejected his, his plan that he revealed to me, and I've gone my own way. Therefore, God has caused this great tempest. You better throw me overboard or everyone will perish. And they did. And when they threw him overboard, God stepped in and saved Jonah's life. You see, it was God himself very clearly indicated as the one, as the one who did this. Verse 17 says, the Lord appointed or, or sent out or, or, um, or, or chose a fish to swallow up Jonah. God was the author of Jonah's salvation in this real world, real world circumstance where he was cast into a raging sea. So God himself had the power to command that fish to go up to Jonah in the midst of a sword, storm and swallow Jonah whole. And then we read what happens to Jonah next. Jonah, who, who had been cast to his death, was saved. And then the end of verse 17, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah, somehow, miraculously, by God's 
great sovereignty and deliverance lives in the belly of a fish. With whatever stomach acids and other natural processes were going on in that fish's belly, Jonah survives. It doesn't tell us what kind of fish it was. Um, often you hear about a whale, maybe it was a whale. Uh, but a great, great fish swallows up Jonah, and God miraculously saves his life while he's in the belly of that fish. Then the author tells us that he was in that belly for three days and three nights. This term, three days and three nights, is a term that pops up throughout the Old Testament and also in the New Testament, too. And it's, it's, an, it's an idiom. It's, it's, a, it's a common phrase that means generally about three days. It would be the same as if I said, I spent three full days chopping down that tree and digging out the root. Right? Three full days. I probably didn't spend, um, you know... 72 hours, a physical, complete 72 hours digging out that stump, although most stumps I'm sure would take more than 72 hours to dig out. Um, but if I were to say three full days, it's a common phrase we use in our language to indicate it was three long days. And that's what I think happened here to Jonah as well. Uh, this, this Jonah was in the belly for three very long days. Days, three full days, three days and three nights, as the common idiom in their time would go. So, Jonah is sent to his death. He's saved by God in the belly of the fish. And then verse 10 picks back up what happens to Jonah next. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. God proves himself in control of the fish once again. God speaking to the fish, listening to God's command, doing exactly what God had planned for the fish to do. And it spits up Jonah out upon the dry land. Jonah had run away from the presence of God as he describes it, as, as uh, the author of this text describes it. And God uh, sent him into the sea to his death, saved Jonah's life, and spit Jonah back out exactly where God needed him so that he could do what God had sent him to do. To preach to Nineveh. God controlled the fish and proved himself powerful to save and direct Jonah's life so that Jonah would do as God had directed and God had commanded. It vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. It doesn't say where it vomited Jonah, but I would assume it was within traveling distance to where God was sending him, to Nineveh. Because in chapter 3, as we'll see next week, he goes to Nineveh and is able to make it there just fine. I think here we see God's uh, power to deliver Jonah, um, and, and Jonah doing as God wills, even though Jonah tried his best to run away from the Lord. God had power to rework Jonah's circumstances so that Jonah did exactly what God had desired him to do. Now, Jonah, in his own free will, attempted to run away from God. And God overrid circumstances so that Jonah, maintaining his free will, did exactly as God wished, even though Jonah was trying to run away. So God proved himself to be completely in control. We saw last week, and we'll mention again this week, that when God sends a prophet to speak a message, we can trust what that prophet says because God himself is in charge of the words that come out of a prophet's mouth. We see this in Jonah's life. And in another place we see this is in Numbers 22 through 24. This is the story of Balaam and his donkey, right? Maybe you've heard that narrative before from, from the book of Numbers in the Bible. Uh, Israel, uh, back in, in this story, in Numbers 22, Israel is headed toward the promised land that God had promised them. And as they're headed there, they're about to go uh, near the land of Moab. And the king of Moab named Balak was afraid of the Israelites, for they were known to be a mighty people with a mighty God and great in number. And so King Balak of Moab sends out to this prophet named uh, Balaam, or Balaam, or however you might want to pronounce it there. Uh, Balaam gets called by Balak, and Balak says, hey, Balaam, here's what I want you to do. I want you to come upon this mountain and curse the Israelites. And God speaks to Balaam. And says, you may not speak anything but what I tell you to speak. And so at first, Balaam refuses. But the king sends him again and says, please, please come with me and curse the people of Israel. And Balaam reluctantly agrees to go with them. As he's headed that way, 
he's riding on a donkey, and his donkey sees something that Balaam cannot see. He sees a great angel of the Lord standing in the path, and the donkey is so afraid it will not continue down the path. So Balaam beats the donkey and smacks it with his staff, and the donkey speaks out with a donkey's mouth to Balaam. The text says that God opened the mouth of the donkey, and the donkey literally spoke to Balaam. And the donkey said, why is it that you're beating me? Haven't I been good to you in the past? Don't I do what's good for you and carry you where you wish me to carry you? And then Balaam's uh, eyes were opened to see the angel of the Lord and the great danger that he was in. If he had gone any further, then his life would have been forfeit to that angel. And then the angel speaks out for the Lord and says to Balaam, he says, you may go with these men to the king, but you must only speak the words that I tell you. When he gets to the king, the king says to him, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make some sacrifices, and then you're going to look out over the people of Israel, and you're going to proclaim a curse. I've hired you to come proclaim a curse. Now, this is what you're going to do. They make the sacrifices. Balaam gets out to speak against the people of Israel, but instead of a curse, out of his mouth comes a blessing, a great blessing upon the people of Israel, and a pronouncement of judgment against Moab for refusing Israel passage. And another time, the king says, or the king says, when, when Balaam pronounces a blessing, he says, why have you done this? I paid you to curse them. Let's try this again. So they go up to another place, and they see another portion of the army. And again, only a blessing comes out of his mouth. Four times, Balaam is asked by the king to curse Israel. And four times, only a blessing comes out of his mouth when he was paid to curse God's people. And at the end of it, not only does a blessing come out for Israel, but a curse comes out against the people who had hired the prophet to curse Israel. Against the Moabites and the, the Amorites and other people that were going against Israel. The Israelites. So we saw in that case too that when a prophet spoke, it was God's word and what God had intended that prophet to say came out of his mouth. God did not override the free will of Jonah, nor did he override the free will of Balaam, but yet God was completely in control of all that was said by those two prophets. In Jonah chapter 2, we see that God is in charge of his prophets. He has all the power in the world to arrange events so that everything happens exactly as God plans. So from this, we have the question for ourselves. Do we trust God in our current circumstances? Do you trust God that no matter what's happening in your life, no matter what distress you're experiencing, that God is working out his plan in your life? Do you trust God to... Work out his plan so that wherever you go, his plan is being fulfilled for you. Do you know that he can indeed rearrange the circumstances around you so that you will be exactly where he wants you to be? And do you know that whatever distress you're currently in, God is there with you and he has a plan for the place that you're currently in? Amen. Church, I hope you do and I hope you can trust God no matter what circumstances you find yourself in today. And secondly, I think we, we should learn this as well, that we should go wherever God sends us. We shouldn't be like Jonah and try to run away from God's will because God can just rearrange circumstances and put us exactly where he wants anyways. Church, do you know where God has you now and where he is sending you, yet are you reluctant? Do you know that God wants you to spend more time with your neighbors and share the gospel with them, but you're reluctant because it's... Scary. Do you know what God would have you do in regards to your children or your relatives or your neighbors or your family and friends, yet you are reluctant to do what God would have you do? Church, don't be afraid to do what you know is God's will in your life because God will provide everything you need to do exactly what he has called you to do. He will give you the strength and the courage and the means to do all that he has for your life. So church, when you know what it is God's will to do, then do it knowing that God will be there with you and will direct and guide the path so that all that he has for you to do will certainly be accomplished. Oh church, trust in the Lord, for he has 
Let's look now at Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And in this section, we're going to see that Jonah was in great distress. We get the beginning of Jonah's prayer to the Lord. He cries out to God, and we see that cry of great distress to the Lord. So here's the prayer that happens in between these two things. Jonah was swallowed. Three days later, he was spit out. And in the middle of that, he cries out this prayer. Look at Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of the shield I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I went down, to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. So this first half of Jonah's prayer is a, a prayer of distress, stating all that Jonah had experienced and and then toward the end, even amplifying it with some imagery there. Jonah called out to the Lord, and, and we see a summary of this entire prayer in verse 2. He called out to the Lord, and out of Jonah's distress, God answered him. He restates that same point, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. So Jonah, when he's in great distress, tossed over the edge and is pushed under by the waves and the storm, he cries out to the Lord. Now, if water's rushing into his lungs, maybe he couldn't physically cry out, but he's, he's in great distress, and he, he says, Lord, help me. I'm crying out to you. The middle of verse 2 has a really uh, uh, interesting uh, turn of phrase here. He says, out of the belly of Sheol, I cry. So, so Jonah is sinking into the depths of the waters. And while Jonah is praying this prayer, he is literally inside the belly of a fish. <laughs> the fish was his salvation to Jonah. God sent the fish to save his life from the tempest, from the storm. So while he's in the middle of a fish, literally inside the belly of a fish, he calls out to God and says, God, you saved me from the belly of the underworld. You saved me from the belly of Hades, from, from being in the midst of death. You... Out of my death, in the midst of it, as if I were in the belly of death, you saved me by putting me in the belly of a fish. That word sheol in the Old Testament refers to the place you go after death. It's a very general term. It can refer both to heaven or hell, as we see it described in the New Testament. But it's a very general word describing the concept that the Old Testament people had in their minds of some after death we go somewhere where is that place it's called Sheol. so Sheol is a very general term and in the minds of the israelites they picture Sheol as that place we go to after death so Sheol uh, can refer to heaven or hell as we might call it but it's a general term referring to the place that people go to after death uh, it's often a picture for death itself Going down to Sheol is a, a phrase they use, a term to describe dying. If I'm dying, I'm going down to Sheol. I'm buried with my fathers, is another way that they say it. They're dying. So out of the, the clutches of death itself, out of the belly of the, the underworld, if you will, he was saved. Verses 3 through 5, he continues to describe his distress. He describes very dramatically, very with, with great imagery here. You can picture it in your mind. Jonah being cast into the deep. He's thrown overboard and plunged deep, deep, deep down by the storm that's coming around him. The floods of the ocean surrounded him, and he had nowhere to go. God's waves and God's billows that he had cast upon the ship were passing over Jonah's head, far up above Jonah's head, for he's way down in the pit of the sea. Jonah then knew that he had been driven away from God's sight and he was being sent off to death. But even in the midst of that verse 4, he had hope and trust in the Lord. You see, he knew when he was saved that he would again look upon God's holy temple. 
Jonah, even though he was in the midst of the sea, uh, in that moment, uh, maybe seeing the fish or experiencing that fish, uh, was able to reflect back and say, yet I know I will see again God's holy temple. Verse 5, he continues, he continues to a description of his calamity. He says, the waters closed in over me to take my life. In the Hebrew, it says, the waters closed in over me up to my very soul. Describing like, uh, maybe we might say it in English, all the way up to my neck, the waters were coming. The waters were, were swallowing me up with my very life and my very soul being swallowed up in the waves and in the water. And then he describes it as if the weeds at the very bottom of the ocean were wrapped around him. He was trapped and could not get out. Verse 6, he uses even more dramatic imagery to describe the kind of distress that he was in. He's described himself as going down to the very roots of the mountains, to the bottom of the ocean. And then finally, the, the, he describes his distress as the land closing bars upon him like he's in a prison trapped at the very depths of the earth. Jonah sunk deep down in his distress to a place he could never have escaped from. As if the, the mountains themselves had locked him at their roots in a, in, a, in a jail cell that he could never break through. The bars of the jail cell of the land had closed upon Jonah forever, is how he describes the situation he was in, his distress. A stark image of the kind of death he knew he was about to experience. Church, we experience trouble often in this life. And when we do, we feel in the midst of that trouble as if there is no hope, as if we're in the bottom of a deep, deep ocean with the bars, the, the jail cell bars closing in upon us in the depth of the ocean. When we go through great distress, what do we do and who can we trust? Church, when we are in trouble, we must know that God has the power to save us from deep, deep hurt, deep, deep pain, and deep, deep trouble. Amen. God is a good and gracious and loving God who has saved us from our sins if we have faith and trust in him. And the God who has at once saved us from our sins and when we pass away, we'll certainly see him again. That God can save you and deliver you from any distressing circumstance here in this life. Amen. Sometimes the worst in this life does happen. A loved one dies. A child dies. We lose the ability to work the way that we used to work. We get in car accidents that are devastating. And when the worst happens, we sometimes go to a dark place in our minds and we feel as though we're trapped in a jail cell at the bottom of the ocean at the roots of the mountains. Church, you will find yourself in that place and you will experience that kind of distress and depression and disturbance in your heart and in your mind. But when you do, church, the message here is you can turn to the Lord, for he is still with you, and he loves you, and he has saved you from your sins, so that even if your very life is taken, you get to be with him in eternity forever. So church, when you are in trouble, trust God and know he has the power to save you, and has indeed saved you if you trust in him, if you trust in so in that section, we saw that when Jonah was in distress, God had the power to save him. Let's turn now to the final section of Jonah's prayer, the end of verse 6 all the way through chapter uh, two, through verse 10, uh, through, through verse 9. Um, in this section, we'll see that God had the power to save Jonah and send him, to save Jonah and send him. Let me read those verses again, Jonah 2, the end of verse 6. Yet... You brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation 
belongs to the Lord. Amen. Salvation belongs to the Lord. We see Jonah proclaiming God's goodness in salvation at the end of verse 6. When Jonah was sunk down as if he were at the roots of the mountain, deep, deep in water he could never swim to the top of, God brought up his life as if he's being brought up from a great pit he had fallen in. Uh, being cast in a pit was certainly a, a, a death sentence on anyone who was cast in. Some of the terrain around Israel had deep, deep pits in it. And sometimes they would dig a pit and cast someone down in, which supposedly would have been casting someone to their death. Like Joseph, whose brothers cast him into a pit that he could not climb out of. Or Jeremiah, who was cast into a muddy pit that he could not climb out of. That was a death sentence for them. But Jonah says, just as someone who is cast into a pit, who gets drawn out and is saved, so Lord, you too saved me from the pit that I was in. When his life was about to be forfeited and it was fainting away, he remembered the Lord, he prayed out to the Lord, and the Lord heard Jonah's prayer. God hears our prayers, all the prayers of those that Love him. Of course, he hears the prayers of everyone, but in a special way, he hears and listens to and responds to our prayers, uh, the prayers of those who have faith in him. Uh, Jonah's prayer came up before God in the place where God's presence was, and God heard his prayer. Jonah mentions in verse 8 that those who pay regard to vain idols uh, forsake steadfast love. They, they run away from steadfast love because steadfast love comes from the Lord and from the Lord only. But Jonah will not forsake the Lord. Instead, he will do what God has sent him to do. And in verse 9, we see him praise the Lord, vowing to do just whatever God would send him to do. For he was a prophet of God. Jonah had promised as a prophet, God, I will speak what you tell me and I will do what you tell me. And he attempted to forsake that. As those people who pay regard to vain idols do. But God saved him. And Jonah again renews that vow to do everything the Lord would have him to do. Verse 9. But I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. Jonah who tried to run away from the Lord. God saved him from death. And so Jonah renews that vow. and says with thanksgiving Lord. When I get to offer a sacrifice again. I will offer it to you and to you alone. Lord, whatever I have vowed to do, I will do to you. And then we get that great summary verse in verse 9. I think verse 9 really captures the entirety of this prayer here in one simple line. The final line of verse 9. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Amen. Jonah knew this. And trusted in the God to whom salvation belonged. And because of that, he was willing to renew that vow to the Lord, the Lord of faithful love, of steadfast love. Salvation belongs to the Lord is a really common phrase throughout the Psalms. Uh, it's, it's one of the refrains of the Psalms. Another refrain is, uh, his steadfast love endures forever, or, or the faithful love of God endures, endures forever. But another phrase we see all throughout the Psalms is, salvation belongs to the Lord. And this means uh, so much more than we might first think when we just read it and then skip on to the next verse. It means that God has the power to save, but it also means that God is the owner of salvation. Salvation is God's and it is no other's. He is the one who's completely in control of salvation. But all the other God that people worshiped back then cannot save. Amen. I cannot save myself. No amount of good works that I do can save, Amen. but only God can save. Yes. God is the complete author of salvation. Amen. We may only be saved through faith in Christ and yes. not through faith in anyone else. Right. Because salvation belongs to the Lord, it does not belong to Baal or to, to Muhammad or to any other prophet or God out there. God's the one who holds yeah. salvation. Yes. Mm -hmm. No other God, no other demon, no other person. We see this same phrase, salvation belongs to God, in Psalm chapter 3, which I have marked here. 
We read through Psalm 3 together a couple of years ago, um, spent a whole Sunday morning on it, and I just want to read it to you again to see this phrase used in the beautiful imagery that talks about God's salvation. Psalm 3 verse 1 says, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. God is powerful to save, and he's like a shield all about anyone who is attacked by their enemies. Anyone who, who repents of their sins and trusts in God is saved by God, and God saves them as if a shield is keeping them safe around every side. If an enemy attacks from the front, God is a shield in the front. If an enemy attacks from behind, God is a shield behind. He's a shield all about us. And then when we are God's people, and when God saves his people, we know that God's blessing will be upon us as well. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. God is a good and saving God, and salvation belongs to the Lord. I want to ask you this morning if the God of salvation is your God. We know that that God created the heavens and the earth, and sadly, we also know that every single one of us has been like Jonah and has run away from God. We have all broken God's law. We have all sinned against him. We have all rebelled against God. Uh, whether we've been in church for, for 50 years or 30 minutes, we all have sinned against God. And because we have sinned against an infinitely holy God, we deserve an infinitely horrid punishment, the punishment of death and separation from God for all eternity. But then God did something to save us because God is the God of salvation and to him belongs salvation. God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty that we should have paid. We deserved punishment for sinning against God, but Jesus took that punishment. And then on the third day, after, after three days and three nights of being in the grave, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, Jesus rose again from the grave, proving that God had power not just to save, but power of life and a resurrection as well. And then we read in Scripture that anyone who repents of their sins and trusts in Jesus is certainly saved. And God is to them their God, the God who has saved them, the God of salvation that is their God, their Father, from that moment forevermore. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, is God your Savior? Mm -hmm. And have you repented of your sins and trusted in Him? I urge you this morning to do that because the truth is salvation belongs to Him alone and there's no other place that you can find salvation. So come to the Lord, repent, turn away from your sins and trust in God and seek salvation in him. And then, once you do, church, do not forsake the Lord. The Lord is your God who has saved you from your sins. How can you forsake him and run away? The message to all of us here this morning who have been saved is this. We must Remain faithful to God and not forsake him as Jonah tried to do. And not forsake him as those people who run after other idols and other gods. Remain steadfast to the Lord for he's a God of steadfast love. Remain faithful to the Lord because he is faithful to us and has saved us from our sins. Oh church, salvation belongs to the Lord. Do not forsake him. Let's pray together as we close. Oh Lord God, we thank you and praise you for you have saved us from our sin. The, the price is paid, the penalty paid. We are not guilty before you if we indeed trust in Christ.
Oh, Lord, help us not to forsake you. Help us to be faithful to you and to imitate your faithful love by having faithfulness toward you. Help us not to run away from you, not to go back into sin, not to get stuck in sin, but to truly trust in you, Lord. Lord, we pray for our loved ones who do not know you, that they would come to know you as a Savior in this world. That they would trust you as Savior and then continue trusting you and never forsake you. Pray for our sisters and brothers who do not know you. We pray for our neighbors and for our relatives and family and friends and Pray for Kentuckians and North Americans and people all over the world who do not know you, Lord. We pray that they would come to know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you for being a God of salvation who saves us from our sins. And Lord, we help. Uh, we pray that you would help us to remember that daily and to trust in you and never forsake you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.